Hey everybody, it's Jay here from E2 Language. How are you? I hope you're going well. I haven't seen you in quite a long time. I've been busy doing other stuff. What we're going to do in this lesson is we're going to do like an IELTS speaking mock test and I'm going to be your examiner. So I'll be asking you specific questions. We're going to do speaking part one, which is pretty much just small talk. Okay, I'm going to ask you some relatively straightforward, simple questions and you'll give me a nice reply for each of them. That's easy. Speaking part two is after that. That's where you have to uh, prepare on a certain topic for one minute and then speak for up to two minutes on that topic, trying not to go round and round in circles, trying to, rem uh, trying to speak coherently in a nice structured way, exercising grammatical range, grammatical accuracy, focusing on your pronunciation, and your fluency as well. Then we're gonna get stuck into speaking part three, which is where we get a little bit more philosophical. That is the questions will be a little bit more abstract and as such, they will require you to exercise a bit more of your, let's say your nuanced vocabulary. Some of that less frequent, less common vocabulary. You have to think quite deeply when you're answering those questions in order to maximize your score. Cool, anyway, I'll give you some tips and pointers as we go through, but this will be great practice for you. Okay, so let's start with speaking part one. Let's talk about sport. Did you play sport when you were young? Feel free, by the way, to pause the video if you require further time. 10 seconds is probably a bit short, but you should be speaking for at least 10 seconds on each of these. Please do not give one or two word answers here. Try to exercise your vocabulary and grammar right from the outset. Do you play sport now? What sports are most popular in your country? How important is sport for young people? Okay, how did you go doing that? Now I'm going to attempt these myself. So let me answer my own questions here. So let's talk about sport. Did you play sport when you were young? When I was young, I used to play a lot of different sports. Um, the primary sport I played was cricket growing up. I used to uh, be an opening batsman and I used to also open the bowling as well. But I grew up in the countryside, so there weren't many sports to choose from. Okay. First of all, I just lied completely. I did not open the batting or bowling or whatever I said. I did play cricket. Again, it doesn't matter. One of the key things here is don't let the truth get in the way of a good answer. A good IELTS answer, that is. Um, just say whatever comes into your mind, okay? Just let it be unfiltered and spontaneous because you're not scored on the content uh, per se. You're scored on the vocabulary, the grammar, uh, and the structure. Okay, let's do number two. Let's see what sort of porkies I can come up with. Do you play sport now? Uh, up until very recently, I played sport, but due to coronavirus, I had to stop playing sport. The sport I did play was actually uh, touch football. Cool, that'll do. That was about 10 seconds, that's good enough. Next one, what sports are most popular in your country? Well, I live in a city called Melbourne, Australia, and we have our own brand of football called Aussie Rules or AFL. So we play that in winter, and in summer the most popular sport is cricket. Cool, nice and coherent, pretty straightforward. I just named the two most popular sports here with a little bit of a story about uh, the city that I live in. Last question, how important is sport for young people? I think sport for young people is essential. In fact, I think sport should be made mandatory in all primary schools and secondary schools because it teaches people how to be fit and how to maintain good, healthy exercise habits. Something like that. Nice exercise habits, there's good use of collocations there, um, good straightforward sentence structure. 
Cool. Let's have a look at speaking part two. Okay, speaking part two. This is where it starts to get a lot more tricky, a lot trickier. So if you need help with your IELTS, by the way, check out e2language.com. You can sign up for free and get loads of free stuff, including uh, some free live classes, free material, free methodology lessons, etc. And if you really want some help with IELTS, you can go across to that website and upgrade your account to an Express or an Express Plus package, which will include a mock test, loads of material, lots of stuff that is not on YouTube, for example. Uh, you can upgrade further for tutorials, writing feedback, speaking mock tests, the whole lot. Okay, so this is it. So on test day, what's going to happen is the examiner will hand you a piece of paper and the piece of paper will have something like this on it, a topic. It might say something like, describe a time when the weather prevented you from doing something. You should say what your plan was, what weather you were hoping for, what happened, and explain how you felt when you had to change your plans. You'll have one minute to prepare to speak for up to two minutes. This is gonna be pretty tricky. What you might wanna do is make sure you have a long introduction. You can really elaborate on each of those dot points. And again, don't let the truth get in the way of a good IELTS answer. The other thing you can do is feel free to split this into two stories or even three stories. You might wanna tell a story that happened in the past and one that happened more recently, for example. Let's see how you go. I'll give you one minute to prep and then two minutes to speak. How did you go doing that? That's pretty tough, isn't it? Especially if you're just telling the one story because to tell the one story and to maintain speech for two minutes requires you to elaborate in, in, in really 
interesting ways. One of the things that you will need to try to avoid when you're telling this story or speaking for two minutes is going round and round in circles telling, saying the same thing again and again. I wonder if that's something that you did. All right, I'm going to do the same thing. When I uh, look, did the one minute preparation time, I noted down sort of three stories, okay? You are not penalized for telling three stories. Although the topic cue card says, to, um, says something about a an event or a thing, one thing, if you do in fact talk about two or three things, that is completely fine. The cue card there is just to guide you. Again, there's nothing in the criteria, in the scoring, um, that marks you against that. However, you do need to actually speak on topic. All right, let me tell my story for two minutes, see how I go. Okay, let me bring this up. Okay, so I'm going to tell you about a few different times where weather has actually prevented me from doing something that I was planning on doing. So firstly, the first story that comes to mind is from a place called Jogjakarta in Java in Indonesia where I lived when I was about 22 years old. And this particular place uh, is prone to very wild weather. It has a dry season and a wet season. And in the wet season, when it rains, it rains like you've never seen rain before. Um, I believe it's a type of tropical rain. And it would happen at a particular time each day. And so what would happen is I would be riding my scooter to university, for example, and it would begin to rain and I would have to stop and basically hide in a shop with other people who were doing the same thing because it would just begin to pour. So I was on my way to university. Of course, I was hoping for weather that would be clear and nice and sunny so I could ride to university and not get wet, but that's what happened. And of course, when that happened, you would sort of get used to it. So it wasn't disappointing or it wasn't a shock. It was just something you became accustomed to. A second event that happened that is similar is when I was at a festival and it was actually just too hot to do anything. So although there were bands playing and there were events happening, etc., I believe the temperature reached something like 43 degrees. This is in a, a part of central Australia. And as such, you were rendered completely useless because it was simply too hot. You would have to stay in the single spot just to keep cool enough um, so that you didn't overheat or well, let's see, nothing would happen to you medically. So that was another type of event like this. Oh my God, was that all right? That was all right, I suppose, not great. Cool, so what did we learn there? Well, I learned that <laughs> sometimes you say stupid things in IELTS speaking part two, but that's just the nature of the beast. Um, if you do say something that's a little bit silly, what did I say? I said people overheat. Do people overheat? They're not like car radiators, are they? Anyway, that's gonna happen. So what else? Well, I basically switch from one story to the next. I, tell, I told quite an elaborate story about the rain in Jogjakarta. Um, then I switched to another event entirely because quite simply, I was out of ideas about that single event in Jogjakarta and the rain. So I switched to another event where it was too hot. So I moved basically from one topic to the next. Um, still within the topic of weather, but I talked about rain and then I talked about heat, okay? Now you can do that or you can think about splitting your story into past, present, future. Um, tell a story about an, a weather event in the past, one that's more recent, one that's possibly in the future. Think about breaking your stories up like that. That's helpful, okay? And it enables you to elaborate and to use language that is uh, particular for that topic, right? I think I said some good sorts of phrases and collocations, etc. Um, and I wasn't, well, hopefully I wasn't waffling too much. Cool, all right, let's move on to speaking part three. All right, again, if you need help, particularly with uh, IELTS speaking part two, or you wanna do a speaking mock test, check out e2language.com. Okay, speaking part three, here we go. It's gonna get a lit little bit philosophical now. So let's talk about the weather. In what way do people discuss the weather in your country?
you don't need to speak for 30 seconds by the way. This is a, a good indication of how long you should speak for on these particular questions. But if you hit 20 seconds or so, I think that is also fine. What type of weather do people prefer in your country? Are weather forecasts accurate in your country? Are there any dangerous weather events in your country? Okay, now let me answer my own questions and I'll give you a bit of an example of how I would do this. So, in what ways do people discuss weather in your country? I would answer it like this. I would say, uh, in Australia, talking about the weather is a very common form of small talk. So, it's very common that when you bump into somebody in a shop, for example, and you don't know the person particularly well, the way that you would break the ice is to say something like, wow, it's really rainy today, or geez, the weather's nice today, or something like that. Some people don't really like talking about the weather. In fact, I know of a particular company where they've banned the use of talking about the weather in their company. That's actually true, by the way. Um, but anyway, that was just an interesting little bit that I'd put on the end there. Um, but I did get to exercise some vocabulary around small talk. Um, I've forgotten what I said, but hopefully that was okay. Next question. What type of weather do people prefer in your country? So let me just sort of think through this aloud. What would I talk about here? Like immediately I think, okay, people dislike winter here. Um, what I would also say is Australia is a very big country, so the weather patterns are completely different in the north to the south, to the east to the west, etc. So I might start with that, and then I'd talk about people um, basically liking summer, spring, and autumn, disliking winter. So my answer would be something like this. I would say, well, it's hard to generalize to the entire country of Australia because it's such a large country, but certainly where I live, people dislike winter. Winters are very long and cold and sort of grim, and after too much gray sky, people really crave sunshine. So I would say that people particularly like summer, it's a very active time of year, but also spring and autumn are beautiful too. Cool, all right, I'm gonna talk through number three. Are uh, weather forecasts accurate in your country? Cool, so I'll do the same thing. I'm gonna not generalize, bring it closer to my, uh, my city. I'm gonna talk about weather fluctuations, changing weather, it's very difficult to predict, um, something like that. So let's see what pops out. I would say, again, Australia is a very big country, so you can't really generalize for the whole of the country. I certainly know in the north of Australia, the weather is far more predictable. It really does follow a sort of wet season, dry season type of uh, pattern. In the south of Australia, where I live, the weather is very unpredictable. Um, a lot of the weather comes in from different um, wind directions, for example, so it might be uh, sunny one day and rainy the next, and often the forecasts are simply wrong. That'll do, whatever. Next one, are there any dangerous weather events in your country? Okay, so first thing that comes to mind in Australia, of course, is bushfires. Um, so I'd talk about that. Then the next sort of idea that pops into my mind is something about climate change, and maybe I could make a sort of 
statement about hope that hopefully weather patterns will um, become uh, what's the word um, uh, less less crazy uh oh let's see what sort of language I can come up with here so I'd say something like well we're lucky in Australia we don't really have hurricanes or floods so much one of the things that we need to be really careful of in Australia is bushfires and that certainly happens in my state in Victoria in Australia um, and I think with climate change happening, I think these weather events are going to become more frequent. So hopefully, hopefully we can do something to make them less frequent. Ta-da, the end. Cool, so that would give you a bit of an example of how IELTS speaking is done. So you start with part one with those small talk questions where you need to sort of elaborate, talk for about sort of probably 10 to 15 seconds, you know, get some good language out, don't just answer with one or two words. Part two, you had an experience of how difficult it can be, to be honest, to be to speak for up to two minutes on a single topic without just going round and round in circles. And as I mentioned, I recommend splitting it into several stories, past, present, future, or several different topics based within the main topic. So if it's weather, you might talk about heat, rain, whatever, something like that, okay? That will help you out. Then finally, in part three, we looked at some more abstract questions that really make you think and make you respond with, with far more sophisticated language use, where you really do need to exercise more complex sentence structures, better vocabulary, etc. And all the while, we're thinking about fluency, so we're not hesitating too much. We're not saying um and ah too much. We're thinking about vocabulary. We're thinking about vocabulary in two ways. We're thinking about it in terms of precision, that is, we're using the right word at the right time. And we're also thinking about vocabulary in terms of range, that is, we're not just repeating the same word again and again. I think before I said the word common and common twice. You know, common, frequent, infrequent, you want to mix up your synonyms. Grammatical accuracy means that my verb tenses, my prepositions, my plural nouns are all accurate, but also grammatical range in that my sentence structures vary if I can. Okay, I don't want to just answer in short, simple sentences. I want to uh, create a range of different sentence types. These should come naturally to you. It's the grammar that follows the meaning or the idea. So it's idea first, and then we're putting it into language to put it out there, right? By the way, I should mention at this point, if you require help on any of your fundamental skills, that is vocab, pronunciation, by the way, pronunciation is the other one, pronunciation or grammar, check out e2school.com. You can sign up for some free courses there to help you with grammar, vocab, and pronunciation, which are the three pillars, the three ingredients of language, and certainly all languages, and particularly, no, not particularly, English as well. Cool, that's all from me. Nice to see you again. I hope that was some semblance of fun. I hope you're staying safe. Remember to check out e2language.com if you're preparing for your IELTS test. See you soon.